<laughs> okay, does everybody have a copy of the notes? Um, we've got a homework assignment to do on Friday, and, uh, and then another one on Wednesday. It's chapter 9 stuff that is related to pumps, which we're starting today. If you look at the schedule, actually, today's lecture was scheduled to be um, uh, surge tanks and uh, water hammer, but we're going to do that on, um, on Friday because there's going to be some high school students joining the class on Friday in here, and I thought that maybe that lecture would be a little bit more accessible to them than pumps. So we're just going to switch it. Can you give me a quiz? Quiz on the first day. I thought that the, yeah, I thought I remembered we were gonna have one today, but maybe maybe not. We'll have, maybe we won't have to have one on Friday. That's a super idea. Say say the word quiz about once a week so that I just uh, remember that we need to be doing that. I don't enjoy them any more than you. It's a lot of work grading them. Um, so, we're, uh, looking a little bit further into the future, then we'll have an exam a uh, week from this coming Friday on the 22nd. Any questions on these announcements? So, we're talking about pumps today. And uh, the purpose of a pump is to add energy. And if we look at the energy equation, uh, remember that head is the sum of all of the possible forms of energy. And a positive displacement pump, like the screw pump that's shown here, works to add additional energy in the form of increasing the Z of water. And let's watch a little animation of a screw pump to get a sense for what it looks like. Okay. So you can see that with each rotation, it lifts a certain volume of water, and then uh, we'll do that one more time. <clears throat> so as it rotates, it's lifting water, and um, there's a watertight seal between the screw and the, the bottom and the sides of the, uh, of the little trough or reservoir that water is being lifted from until it makes its way to the top, and then it, it dumps. It's adding it as elevation. It's lifting the water to a higher elevation. And so it's increasing the uh, potential energy by lifting it. So it's adding energy at Z. Now it's open to the atmosphere. And so, um, you know, once the water is lifted up to that new location, if, if this is going to be close conduit flow, then it would need to enter an enclosed pipe and it would only be pressurized in as much as it's at some elevation above um, where the water is being delivered. And so you could use a, a pump like this, for example, to take water to uh, an elevated storage pump, and then the, the city's pipe network would be pressurized because uh, you know, the, the elevated pump is at some elevation above where people are actually using the water. So each revolution of that pump will uh, lift the water a certain height. And um, this is not a very common way of, uh, of adding energy to a system. Uh, positive displacement pumps like the screw pump and some others that we'll take a look at are used in a lot of applications, but not really in uh, pipe networks delivering residential water. And so here are some other positive displacement pumps uh, starting with the rope pump, what you'll notice is that there is a, a flexible rope with some plugs at different spacings. And as those plugs go up through the uh, pipe shaft, what it's doing is it's trapping water in a lot of the same way that the screw pump was. A, a constant volume of water is being lifted physically, and someone would be rotating that, uh, that crank in order to make the, the plugs go through the, um, the shaft. Um, so rope pumps would be very difficult 
for uh, an underground aquifer that's really deep because you think about what the person is actually lifting is the weight of the water. And, and if you have a, a really long pipe, you're going to have to find out what's the volume of water inside of the, uh, inside of the pipe because any water that's from the water surface up to the where this pipe comes off of the main shaft and is the water's coming out, you're going to have to be able to lift the weight of the water from the water surface up to this point. And so maybe that's why there's a long crank on it is to give mechanical advantage as you're lifting that water. Um, but it's a very uh, simple and low-tech way to deliver water and easy for someone who's out in a, a very remote area to repair it and keep it working. Um, the internal gear pump is kind of interesting idea. It's using uh, these, these gears as, once again, it's kind of a plug. And water um, is, is going from the inlet to the outlet, both uh, through the outside of the gear and through the inside. Each of the rotations is delivering a certain volume of water. Um, it's not going to add a lot of pressure. It's um, going to be a low head type of a pump. All of these are relatively low head type pumps. A peristaltic pump is used a lot in environmental engineering, uh, like in a lab environment where you need to deliver a constant steady flow rate of a very small volume of water. Um, the way that it would work is that you know, if this is a flexible a flexible plastic tube of some sort, and so that by pinching the tube together, uh, you're creating a watertight seal, and then as that rotates around in a circle, it's going to draw water from the suction side, uh, and um, because of the pinch point, just push it through to the outlet side. Um, so this is the same, this peristaltic pump is probably used in the me medical industry where they have the flexible tubing. If you want to control the rate that um, as someone's IV, the fluid would be coming in through the IV. You, know, you can hang a bag above someone and just sort of let gravity be in control of how quickly that liquid goes into someone. Or with a peristaltic pump, the rate that that is rotating along with the known inner diameter of the tubing is going to govern the, the, the volumetric flow rate that comes out. What's most used in like a public situation or just a common situation? like in water networks like here in Huntington, none of these positive displacement pumps would be in use for a water delivery. Um, right. Instead, they're uh, centrifugal pumps that we'll take a look at in a minute. But these are all kind of specialty pumps that are um, either novelties or useful because they have um, the ability to deliver a certain volume of flow rate regardless of the head that it's going against. You know, that, that a constant speed is going to deliver a, a constant volume. Um, the, the centrifugal pumps that we're going to take a look at, they actually, the, the volumetric flow rate changes based on the, um, the head that they're working against. Whereas a lobe pump, if this is rotating at a certain RPM, it's always going to deliver the, certain, the same volume of water, regardless of whether it's going against uh, one head of resistance or 30 uh, meters of head of resistance. That just uh, a certain rotation, or if you can maintain the certain rotational rate, the same volume is always going to be associated with that rotational rate. Um, a radial flow pump like this, though, um, doesn't have that advantage. It's able to add energy in the form of pressure. And water comes in through the suction side in one direction. We're looking at an isometric view here. So we're looking at an angle. Water is coming in one direction, and then it uh, exits uh, through another axis. And so it's changing directions from the inlet side to the outlet side. And uh, these curved veins accelerate the water. and uh, through that acceleration are adding pressure. And it's not a uh, local acceleration. It's not like the water is necessarily speeding up um, from the inlet side to the outlet side. Because remember that the continuity relationship says that what flows into 
uh, control volume has to flow out. And so if you have a pump and uh, the diameters of the pipe is the same coming in as it's going out, you know, if, if the D is constant, then the velocity in will equal the velocity out. They're going to be equal because Q in has to equal Q out. And so when I say there's an acceleration there, it's not a local acceleration like the water is speeding up from the inlet to the outlet, but uh, it's a convective acceleration and um, uh, and because of it, a pressure accumulates and uh, an energy is added as it rotates like that. And uh, a related pump, these are also very common, axial flow pump. Uh, the difference here is that the water isn't changing direction in an axial flow pump. It's sort of an impeller that is uh, connected to a shaft and the motor would be outside of the um, outside of the chamber the water is flowing through. Um, axial flow pumps are sometimes used when you're having to lift water from an underground aquifer and the motor would be mounted at the surface and the uh, impeller head would be down inside the shaft under the water uh, under the water table and so there, there would be a rotating metal shaft connecting the two. And it wouldn't be practical to, to bury a centrifugal pump underground. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, though, what about fire hydrants? Are they just under pressure or are they have yeah. pumps underneath? Or? They don't have a pump underneath. They're, they're just connected to the normal city water network. And, uh, and they represent a pretty important aspect of network design. Um, on Wednesday of next week, we're, I'm going to give you the first part of the design project assignment. And uh, you're going to be, this semester for your design project, uh, sizing a network for an entire hypothetical city. And one of the main concerns you're going to have is making sure there's enough pressure there during a fire event. Uh, because the hydrant is just connected to an ordinary, um, an ordinary city water line. Uh, the city lines have to have enough pressure and enough size that uh, they can deliver the amounts of water that's needed by the fire department. So the reason why a fire truck will have a pump inside of it is that they may need to pressurize the water so they can spray it up really high, you know. Um, and so they, they have on board auxiliary pumps because they're going to need even more pressure than, than the, the hydrants at. But the, hyd the hydrants under enough pressure to deliver the water to the, the secondary pump that's inside of a fire truck. What, yeah, yeah. It's supposed to have enough pressure. And the design con condition you're going to be looking at is, um, you know, water use varies during the day. People use a lot more water at 7 in the evening than they do at 4 a.m. You know, there are these daily cycles of water use, and there are seasonal cycles of water use as well. And so the design condition is, consider what is the network going to be like 20 years from now or 50 years from now when the, the city or whatever developed area you're planning for is completely built out and it's the hottest day of the year and people are using lots of water and then that's when the fire happens. I mean, you have to be really ready for the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. is, is the, uh, on that last pump, yeah. is the diameter of the inlet typically larger than the diameter of the outlet? It is. Do you know why? Because the velocity out will be faster than the velocity in. Uh, no, that is that is because of the diameters. It, it's, not, um, it's not that they would be different if the diameters weren't the same. But you're, you asked the question, is the inlet diameter ordinarily bigger? And it is. And the reason why they, or, they make the inlet diameter bigger is to avoid cavitation. We'll go into the details of that, but it's not having to do with the fact that if they weren't the uh, different diameters, that the velocities would be different. The velocity will be the same if the diameters are the same because, uh, because of continuity. And, and so the pump is adding head, but it's not adding it. This kind of pump is not adding it as elevation. It's not adding it as additional velocity. The head is being added in the form of additional pressure. 
That's what a, a radial flow pump does. So does an axial flow pump. They both add additional pressure. And in, in, in so doing, the, velocity move, the water moves through the system with a higher velocity. And that's why sometimes people confuse cause and effect when it comes to pumps. They think, well, the, the pump has added velocity to the system. And that's not true. The system is moving faster because there's more pressure, not because the pump has added velocity. So the additional velocity that exists when a pump is in place is the, uh, the result of the pump. So like even if we had an elevated storage tank, and uh, here's water, and here's a water line, you know, we could put a pump on there, and here's water spraying out. So water would spray out even if the pump is off. If the pump is off, it'll spray out a little bit. But if you turn on the pump, it'll spray a lot faster. And the reason why is because there's now more of a pressure difference between the, down, the, the uh, upstream end of the pipe and the downstream end of the pipe. It's, it's not that the pump added the velocity. The pump added the pressure. If you think about it enough, you can convince yourself that that's the case. <laughs> All right. Uh, the line that feeds the pump has a suction side and a discharge side. And a pump like this that would be mounted uh, next to a reservoir, you can see that here the triangle and the little horizontal line, that represents like rippling water. It's supposed to, it meant to evoke what uh, a free surface of water might look like. So we have a free surface of water and um, and so the water that's inside of the inlet line, first of all, has to pass through a strainer that would be uh, a mesh meant to keep debris from going into the pump and causing damage. Um, but as the water enters, remember, water flows from high to low pressure. And we've talked about that in the last few lectures, that water moves from high head to low head, or high pressure to low pressure. And so as water is entering this pipe, it has to be having a decrease in the pressure as it gets closer to the pump. The water flows from high pressure to low pressure. And so as the water pressure is decreasing, you actually are getting closer and closer to the point that the water could begin to cavitate. And does anyone remember what cavitation is? Or when cavitation occurs? Okay. It's, uh, it's little uh, vapor bubbles. It's not air, though. It's actually vaporized water. And so it's not like, you know, uh, air is nitrogen and oxygen. The tiny little bubbles that form during cavitation are actually H2O bubbles. And why do those bubbles sometimes form? Because of the pressure drop. Mm -hmm. pressure drop. Vapor pressure. And so uh, liquids have this natural tendency to volatilize. Alcohol volatilizes more quickly than water. Uh, oil volatilizes less quickly than water. You know, water has this propensity to evaporate, and when the, uh, the pressure of the surrounding, surrounding a molecule is less than its vapor pressure, then it will begin to boil. And that's why when we heat water and increase its vapor pressure, eventually we'll see it boil. So in this case, the water is entering the suction side and the pressure is decreasing and decreasing, and if it decreases enough, there's a risk that cavitation can occur. And we'll talk more about cavitation next Monday, um, but just as a preview, we have to make sure that the, uh, the suction side pipe isn't too long, or we have a big diameter suction side pipe is a good practice because then that will reduce the velocity. If it was a small diameter pipe, then the velocity would be moving faster. And remember that head losses, H sub F, is a function of F, L, V squared divided by D, 2, G. And so a high velocity is going to have a really negative effect on how much energy is lost as water flows through the suction side hose. And so sometimes the suction side has a bigger diameter than the discharge side just so that we can ensure that the velocities going into the pump are low and that there's less energy loss in the suction side and therefore less risk of cavitation. 
But really what we're talking mostly about today is pump operations. And you'll remember that last semester we touched on the issue of efficiency. And so the efficiency factor is a ratio of how much power actually is delivered to the fluid relative to the amount of power supplied to the shaft. And so a pump's efficiency uh, is shaped by a lot of factors. And if we use a certain pump, for example, we could use this pump um, on different types of fluids. We could use it at different speeds. Um, sometimes people say pump when what they mean is pump and motor. The pump is just the thing that is adding pressure to the liquid. And it is, uh, it is turned by a motor, but sometimes people call the combination of the motor and the pump together just a pump, and, and that's fine. But what we have to, uh, when we're talking about efficiency, make clear is that um, this efficiency factor that is shown here is talking about just the efficiency of the, uh, the power that's delivered to the shaft versus the power that's delivered to the fluid. There might be additional efficiency losses if you consider the electricity that's put into a motor versus the uh, amount of power that comes out of that motor. Or if it's a, uh, uh, a mechanically driven pump you know, based on internal combustion, sometimes they'll have pumps by the side of the road along highways to, uh, to dewater a ditch or something. And so if you think about the amount of energy that's in the gasoline that goes into that pump versus um, how much how much power is uh, is required to actually move the water by the pump? There are some pretty significant losses there. Um, so some of the factors that can affect how well a pump works is you consider the the density of the fluid or the viscosity of the fluid. There are different types of pumps used for different fluids, and a water pump wouldn't be as effective at transferring a highly viscous liquid. Um, especially because water pumps are usually intended to be run at a pretty specific speed. And you notice one of the factors that are listed here is the rotational rate of the pump. Uh, because of the blade angle and the diameter of the impeller and the diameter of the uh, surrounding shaft, um, there's a pretty narrow range that pumps are highly efficient. And so if you have a pump that's meant to be working at 800 RPM uh, using water and then if you switch to a highly viscous fluid, then most likely you'd have to have a different rotational rate and the pump would be a lot less efficient if it's operating under conditions that are um, not what it was designed for. And um, there are different pump series that have the same kind of shape. Uh, the, the impeller shape, if we go back to this, um, the, the blade angle and the blade length relative to the impeller diameter. Um, there are different series of pumps where there'll be a 6-inch diameter version of it and a 12-inch diameter version. And when they're talking about diameters, they're most often talking about the diameter of the pipe on the pressure side. And so you can have very similar sized pumps that will have similar performance properties that are intended for different flow rates. And so if you have an idea of what range of flow rates are going to need to be uh, moved around, then that helps uh, to select their correct pump. And the energy that isn't delivered to the fluid is lost primarily to heat. And um, the water heats up just imperceptibly almost, but over the long term, uh, it is possible to measure an increase. And um, when I was working as a graduate student, actually, I had a reservoir of water, and I was um, running it through a reactor. So I just had a big tank of water and uh, had a pump, and I was running it through a, a UV reactor, which is meant to disinfect water. So I was running it through, and then it would go back into the reservoir. And over the course of a day or two, actually, you you could measure the temperature of that water kept increasing. It started at about 15 degrees Celsius and over, se over several days got up to about 26 degrees Celsius. And so it was almost warm enough to swim around and be very pleasant. Kind of an inefficient way to heat a swimming pool, but um, we could do energy balance to, um, to measure how much of the energy that went into the pump was lost 
versus how much was required to actually make its way into the reactor and um, overcome the head losses through the piping. So you were trying to like clean the pool that way? No, trying to kill bugs, disinfect bacteria with the reactor. And, and I actually wasn't trying to kill the bugs that would be in the water. That's what these reactors are normally used for, but I was trying to test the performance of the, uh, the reactor in certain ways. I should show you guys some pictures. It was a pretty interesting project. How well a pump is able to operate is uh, defined usually by an equation, or there are tables based on these equations. And if we graph, what we can see is that uh, at zero flow rate, a pump is able to deliver a certain amount of head. Um, and the interpretation of that is really um, if you were trying to lift water into, let's say now that the, the flow rate direction is reversed in this little drawing that I've done of an elevated water tank. So the, uh, the water is going this way, in this example, into the tank. How high can the tank be before the pump simply can't get any water in there? You know, if, if, a, if the tank is relatively low, it can get water in at a certain flow rate. But as you continue to raise the tank higher and higher, the flow rate that the pump can deliver water to that elevated location decreases. And so the shutoff head that is shown here on the, uh, on the graph is the point at which the head that it's working against is so great that it can't deliver any flow rate. And so um, the flow rate increases the less head the pump is required to deliver. And that's the interpretation of the pump operation curve. And this is just an example performance curve here. It's not every pump has the same performance curve, but um, the way it works is that 24.4 is the shutoff head. It's the intercept when the x-axis is equal to zero. At zero flow rate, then it delivers 24.4 meters of head. And then as the flow rate increases, you can see there's an exponential uh, relationship between flow rate and the pump head. So the pump is overcoming friction losses. The, the water that's flowing in the line from the pump to its ultimate destination is experiencing resistance to flow through that channel. And so the pump is overcoming that resistance. It's also having to uh, account for an elevation difference between wherever the, the source of the water is if it's sucking it from a, uh, if it's if water is being sucked from a, a reservoir that's below the pump, then it's not just this is not delta z from the uh, the pump to the water surface. The delta z is actually going to be from the origin water surface to the ultimate destination. Um, normally, we'll try and have a very limited suction side elevation difference because that can lead to cavitation and ordinarily the uh, suction side friction losses will be relatively small because we try and limit the, uh, the length of the pipe and have a big diameter so the velocity is low. Um, and then of course what the pump is also doing is it's pressurizing the water downstream of the pump and so these are the three terms of uh, having to overcome in the energy equation the friction losses, the uh, elevation difference, and adding pressure to the liquid. And uh, as the flow rate increases in a system, then the pump's ability to add and deliver head decreases as flow rate goes up. Um, and you can see that graphically, that the, the pump can give the most um, amount of energy at low flow rates. And the reason why is that um, as the flow rate increases, more of the energy that is being deliver delivered from the pump to the water, um, uh, losses increase. And also, um, the uh, well, it, it's, it's 
primarily friction losses that account for the exponential relationship. So this is called a, a pump curve. The equation that we were just looking at, screen's locked up a little bit there. Well, it's locked up completely. Yeah, it must be the uh, recording that it's being made. Oh, is there a job update somewhere? I don't see it anywhere. All right, well, if we don't get this working again, the uh, server busy. Who cares? <clears throat> All right. I think it was actually that I have this on my V drive. Um, the, the system curve is um, a relationship that expresses how much energy is required to deliver water as uh, flow rate changes. And consider water flowing from a lower tank up to an, an elevated tank. Uh, what you're going to have to overcome is the elevation difference, uh, overcome the friction losses, and the system equation is accounting for those two things. The elevation difference, the friction losses, and you can also include a term that um, accounts for any local losses that exist in the system. So local losses being, you know, the, the minor loss that's due to a pipe elbow at these locations, a discharge loss here. And so uh, this is the system curve. And for any situation, water flowing between two points, you can create a system curve based on the Darcy-Wiesbach friction factor, which is built into this version of the energy equation, and the elevation difference. And the pump will actually work at the intersection between the system curve and the pump curve. And so it's sort of trying to match up the right pump to the situation and uh, finding a pump that will give you the flow rate that's desired. It is possible to operate pumps at different rotational rates than uh, their primary operating point if you use what's called a variable frequency drive. And that's something that actually changes electricity from 60 hertz to some other frequency. And that's how uh, ordinarily pumps are able to operate at different at other than their normal operating point. That's what it takes is a special drive that will change the uh, frequency of electricity. Um, but what we're going to do is go through an example that shows how to find the operating point. The operating point is how to find what the known flow rate is supposed to be. And the uh, the starting point when doing problems like this is to assume fully turbulent flow, just as a simplifying assumption, because remember, you don't know what the flow rate is going to be, therefore you can't find the F value until you know the flow rate so that you can find the velocity, which tells you the Reynolds number. So we don't know that when we first start off, so we assume fully turbulent flow. And, uh, oh boy. Okay, so let's do that with this example here. Uh, we've got water that's flowing through 120 meters of pipe, and we're going to have to construct a system curve to match up with the given operating uh, pump curve. The, the pump curve is given here. This pump curve is expressing how much head the pump can add under a changing flow rate. But the system curve is a reflection of what the system looks like. Okay, so the uh, pump curve is H sub P is 24.4 minus 7.65 P 
meter squared. Uh, the length of the pipeline is 120 meters. The diameter, 250 millimeters. The piece of mass is 0 0.25 millimeters. K is 2.4. And delta Z is 9.1 meters. Uh, the area of this pipe, pi d squared divided by 4, gives us 0 0.04909 square meters. And uh, the F value, assuming fully turbulent, fully turbulent flow, FPF, I guess, um, 1.325 divided by... logarithm 0 0.25 millimeters divided by 3.7 times 250 millimeters. Okay, so assuming fully turbulent flow, the F value is 0 0.0196. And we'll use that to create the system curve. So system curve. H sub P is 9.1 plus Q squared times 0 0.0196 times 120 meters, 2 times 9.81 meters per second squared times the area, 0 0.04909 square meters, square that times the diameter, 0.25 meter, plus 2.4 is the K value, times 2G, times the area squared, 0, 0, 4, 9, 0, 9 meter squared, squared. So with that set up, what I'd like you to try is uh, find the system curve, set the system curve equal to the pump curve, and find out what is the flow rate that's going to result under these conditions. So find the system curve by substituting all those values, and set the system curve equal to the pump curve. Solve for Q. equal to each other, 9.1 plus 249.74 Q squared is equal to 24.4 minus 7.65 Q squared, 257.39 Q squared is equal to 15.3. So Q is 0 0.244 cubic meters per second. Okay, and if we want to check the fully turbulent flow assumption, check fully turbulent flow, the velocity of Q over A is 4.97 meters per second. That gives a Reynolds number of 1.24 times 10 to the sixth, and with the case of S to D of 0 0.001, we can go to the Moody diagram and look to see are we in the fully turbulent range. And so the Moody diagram, starting with the Reynolds number of 1.24 times 10 to the sixth, that puts us uh, in here. <laughs> 
along this line. And the case of S to D of 0 0.001 is about here. So we are, it's pretty flat there. The F value isn't really influenced by the Reynolds number, and so it's okay. Fully turbulent flow assumption is fine. This can also be solved using Excel to find the uh, correct operating point. Um, we're going to try and sit the, set the pump curve and the system curve equal to each other. And so if we have a Q in terms of cubic meters per second, and the pump curve, and the system curve, Okay, we're going to select some flow rates, just 0, 0, 0.05, 0.1. You know, we'll have incremental increasing flow rates. And the pump curve, uh, that is where we were saying uh, 24, 24.4 minus 7.65 times Q squared. Okay. We have the pump curve, and we can find out at a variety of flow rates how much head is being added. And the system curve is nine point one plus two forty nine point seven four times Q squared. And uh, what we're looking for is the point where the difference is very small. So the difference is the pump curve minus the system curve. And what we had found our solution to be uh, was 0.244 cubic meters per second. And that's pretty close to, you know, if we try and find the optimal using goal seek. Where's goals? Data. Data. What if analysis? All right. So uh, if we want our goal to be that this will be zero by changing the flow rate, we'll have it find the flow rate that makes that happen. 0.244. So that the overriding theory is to find the operating point where the system curve and the pump curve intersect. And knowing that will allow you to get a head start on this homework six. If you've already finished homework five, which is the Hazen Williams problems, then feel free and jump ahead to the pump problems as well. All right. That's